Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Johns Hopkins School of Education for our special education, autism, and applied behavior analysis virtual open house webinar. My name is Elizabeth Woodward and I serve as the Director of Admissions here at the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Education. I'm joined this morning by two of our faculty members from special education who will serve as co-presenters. I will introduce both faculty momentarily, but before we get started, I just wanted to cover a few logistical items that we ask you to keep in mind during today's presentation. Okay, while participating in today's event, first we'd like to let you know that the webinar is being recorded. The admissions office will make the recorded presentation available on our website should you wish to review it again, or maybe even to share it with a friend or colleague who may also be interested in our graduate special education programs. We ask that you please enter your first and last name or email address used to register for the event so we may note your participation today. And lastly, please take a moment to make sure your microphone is on mute and your video camera is off. We ask that you keep your microphone silenced for the duration of the presentation. At the end of today's session, I will invite you to ask questions to our presenters and to me using the virtual chat function below. I will read your questions presented to the audience and together with our faculty presenters, we'll provide information and answers to your questions. Next up, I would like to share the agenda for today's virtual event. We will kick off the presentation by sharing a brief overview of the School of Education. I will hand the next portion of the presentation um, over to our faculty presenters, our co-presenters, and return later to review with you important steps on the application process, tuition, financial aid, scholarships, and any questions that you have for the question and answer period. Directly following this presentation, you are invited to join our financial aid uh, director, Heisha Nysmith, in a separate webinar room with any questions you may have about the financial aid application process, grants, or scholarships. I will post a link to join that webinar in the chat box at the conclusion of the presentation. So over the past 13 years, um, the School of Education was established in 2007 and has quickly taken its place as a national leader in education reform through research and teaching. Grounded in Johns Hopkins University's tradition of research and evidence-based practice and innovation, the School of Education has consistently ranked among graduates, the best graduate schools of education in the nation by US News and World Report and the university as a whole in the uh, Times Higher Education World Rankings. So over the past 13 years, the school has grown its mission to train teachers, school leaders, to produce educational scholars, and foster research that leads to evidence-based improvements, particularly in K through 12 education. We have six research centers um, contributing to that effort, including our Research and Reform, Center for Social Organization, Institute for Educational Policy, and Center for Technology and Education. Among our newest is our Center for Safe and Healthy Schools. Today, the school has over 2,465 enrolled students, 127 full-time faculty, um, 30 programs offered on campus and, so, and several selections fully online, and 22,000 alumni. The school has two campuses. Our Columbia Center location and our education building on the Johns Hopkins main Homewood campus located in Baltimore City, as well as the fully online, growing number of fully online programs and collaborations with such national organizations as Teach for America and the Urban Teachers Program. Our special education graduate programs combined have an enrollment of about approximately 85 degree seeking students. The purpose of today's event is not only to help you learn more about the graduate programs in these areas, but it's for you to get a closer look and guidance from our faculty, as well as to learn more about opportunities, trends, and changes in your particular field and program of interest. We hope that this will allow you to discern your next steps and making a decision about whether this graduate program is the best fit for investing in your professional future. This event is also a chance for you to engage, ask questions as you move closer to deciding. 
We hope that this event is useful and look forward to receiving your completed application for one of our upcoming semesters. I will be back shortly with some more details on the application process, but I would now like to introduce this morning's presenters. First, I'd like to present uh, Dr. Lori de Benincourt. Dr. de Benincourt is a full professor and serves as a lead for special education programs at Johns Hopkins School of Education. She is the primary faculty advisor for mild to moderate disabilities majors. Her research interests include preparation for pre-service teachers and mild to moderate disabilities. In 2018, Dr. DeBenport was awarded the prestigious Fulbright Scholarship at the Special, Edu Special Education Institute of Ivotos Loran University of Budapest, Hungary. She has authored several textbooks and written numerous articles related to instruction of students with mild to moderate disabilities. She's also served as editor of teacher education and special education academic journals for the past nine years. She is a member and has served as elected leader within such national organizations as the American Education Research Association and the Council of Exceptional Children, which many of you may recognize as the premier association for special education professionals. Our second presenter today is Dr. Tamara Martyr. Dr. Martyr serves as an associate professor for the Applied Behavior Analysis, Autism and Severe Disabilities programs. She is a licensed psychologist and board certified analyst, BCABAD, and she has worked in the field of applied behavior analysis for over 26 years with extensive experience working with children with developmental disabilities and families in various settings, including schools, homes, and hospitals. Her research interests include improving learning outcomes for students with developmental disabilities and autism through effective training, preparation of educators and professionals who provide educational services. In 2015, Dr. Martyr was honored with the Excellence in Teaching Award from Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association. To start us off with our program information portion of today's session, I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Lori DeBedencourt. Dr. DeBedencourt? Hi, everyone. I'm glad you're here, and I hope this proves to be helpful information for you. Remember, the link will be there at the end for financial aid, but our emails will also be there if you have any further questions once we um, finish up our presentation. We have three program um, people to help you, both Dr. Martyr, myself, and Camilla Mika Sims. She's available as well to help, any help you get any information from admissions, or to process your application. I just wanna emphasize that this might be a great time to go into the field of special education. There is such a shortage across all of the states in, the, in America, and we really do need numbers of teachers in special education for self-contained classrooms, as well as resource classrooms, as well as self-contained schools or hospitals. The states and districts just cannot fill the positions fast enough. And in many cases, they're hiring people on a temporary basis because there aren't enough certified teachers. So we're hoping that we can ease some of that stress on the school districts by providing an avenue for people to take the courses that they need in a pace in which they can um, do it with their other parts of their life and um, try to lessen those shortages and help those students with disabilities. Our master's programs, we have a couple different options. One is for um, teachers who are just seeking initial teacher certification and want to be a special educator. Your background does not have to be in education, you do have to have a bachelor's degree, but you don't have to have a bachelor's degree in the field of education or in the field of special education. We also have an option for individuals who are already teaching students with disabilities and would like to have more information on some evidence-based practices to either improve a student's academic um, behavior or to decrease a student's behavioral issues that might be causing problems for them to learn. 
We also have a master's degree in the area of autism if you're already certified in special education and want to work particularly in that field. In terms of certification, our master's degree is 39 credits, so 13 courses, and it will at the end um, make you eligible for certification in the state of Maryland. If you decide to move outside the state of Maryland, most states are reciprocal, have reciprocal arrangements with the state of Maryland, but you may want to check with that particular state to see if they have any specific tests in addition to the 13 courses that we provide for you. But you will be cert certifiable in the state of Maryland. It does help you understand um, the differences across all disabilities, even though it is listed as a mild moderate disabilities program, you will be able to function in any type of classroom that serves any type of child with disabilities. It is a set of courses that are offered either in the fall, the spring or the summer, and you can take them in the sequence that fits your schedule. Or if you are with our partnership with Montgomery County Public Schools, there's a prescribed sequence. Our classes are held at the Columbia campus, which is located off 95 and Route 175. Our students really enjoy that campus because it's centrally located and there are no parking fees. We do have two internships that are required and we work closely with the students to make sure that we place students in schools if they're not already working in a school situation close to their home. And we try to make it work in terms of what other job that student might have. So if you're not currently working in a school situation, we may schedule your internships closer to the end. We also have two different options in terms of pacing. You can take the courses at your own pace so that you start one semester, you can take as many courses as you want. Most of our students take two courses a semester and finish after about 2.5 years. But we do have some students who move into the area and take a, a number of courses at each semester and finish in one year. But you have up to five years, so you can spread it out if you want to. The Montgomery County Partnership that we have, that option that we have, people who work in Montgomery County as either a substitute or a paraeducator or in any capacity with Montgomery County Public Schools, and they would like to be a certified special educator. They enter our program and apply by April 1 each spring. We interview the individuals in the month of April and May, and they begin that summer taking courses and they finish up the following spring. So it's a two year program. And then Montgomery County Public Schools hire those individuals to work in their school district. The internship experiences, we call them the induction and the culmination. It allows a student to have some supervision working with students in their school or in a school that we place them. They're 10 weeks at length. So for instance, in a spring semester, which is 15 weeks, 10 of those weeks, you'd be working in the schools. We do have summer placements as well. And they typically start in late June when summer school is opened in some of the private schools in our area and also in the public schools in our area for the month of July. We provide some supervisors who are hired by the university and are either previous teachers in the school districts surrounding us or previous faculty members at other universities or at our own university. They go in three times or four times or five times to provide support and suggestions as they watch the intern teach. We also hire mentor teachers that are located in the school placement in which you are working to do your internship and they provide two or three opportunities for you to prepare a lesson, carry out the lesson, and then discuss the lesson with the mentor to determine how you can improve. In addition, during the internship, we have a seminar with an internship instructor. 
where all of the interns come together and discuss issues that have come up either behaviorally or academically. And we talk about how to change behavior or improve academic performance. So there's three parts, three prongs really, where we provide support in order that the intern at the end is feeling very comfortable. I will say that all of our interns, by the time that they finish and graduate, feel very comfortable beginning their first year as a teacher on their own, and they stand up pretty good and are hired. They've, we have had very few, if any, um, graduates who are not hired immediately. In fact, this semester, our interns were told by an HR um, person at a school district that they were hired immediately upon graduation. The highlights of it, what makes Hopkins different? And we get that question a lot from prospective applicants. The 13 courses in four semesters, that may be typical with other university programs you might be looking at. I think what makes ours a bit different is that we have very specific method courses in the areas of math, spoken and written language, transition and behavior management. For instance, as you know, many kids in that are receiving an IEP or have special needs have some behaviors that interfere with their learning. We provide both a classroom management course in which you would learn how to manage the behavior in a classroom either as a total group of students in your class or individualized classroom management. In other words, if you have one student that's really causing some problems in your classroom, you would be learn how to implement maybe some individual contracts with that student. In addition, you'll learn how to apply applied behavior analysis with your students in the sense of identifying a behavior you want to change, collecting data on it, providing an intervention, and seeing the changes and monitoring the progress of that child. So you have two behavior management courses. In addition, you'll learn how to apply some evidence-based techniques over a wide range of educational settings. So like I said before, our graduates feel very successful that very first day after they finish our program. You will be, as I said before, at the end of our program, you will be approved, it is an approved program, so you will be eligible for certification within the state of Maryland. We do have some paraeducator pathways to certification. One of the things that the school districts have really looked to is supporting their paraeducators to become special educators. Many paras have worked in the field of special education for many years and know and understand the kids that they're serving. The set it program that we have with Montgomery County is one of those pathways. We also sometimes receive funding from the State Department to support other pathways um, for certification for paraeducators. So please email me if you are a paraeducator in another school district. But in Montgomery County, the students in this program are employed by Montgomery County Schools as paraeducators, and they complete their internships in their school without taking, without taking a um, leave of absence. They can do it in their assigned school site. The students in the program receive their salary and their full benefits with Montgomery County. In addition, Montgomery County provides some reimbursement for their tuition during the two years of their study. They don't need to be current Montgomery County public, um, public school employees to join the cohort. They can um, live in Montgomery County and then they will um, come back and uh, or they can live in Montgomery County and apply for the program An interview with us and with Montgomery County um, folks, HR people and the partnership director and then get a job as a paraeducator in Montgomery County. That deadline is April 1st um, for this year's program. We run it every year. So if you don't make this April and you want to try for next April, that works as well.
now turn the presentation over to Dr. Tamara Martyr. Dr. Martyr. Thank you and um, welcome everybody. I'm gonna continue our conversation about our master's um, programs here at Johns Hopkins with focusing on our master's degree that has an emphasis in autism. So as Dr. DeBentoncourt mentioned, most students who come into this program are already certified in special education. However, they're really interested in learning more about serving students with autism. So this program prepares candidates to teach students with autism from birth through adult. Um, it is a 36 credit program, so there are 12 courses. Half of those courses are offered online. Um, so the majority of our autism courses are offered online, while most of our core special ed courses would be face-to-face -face at our Columbia campus. So this program is really designed uh, to enhance um, training for our candidates and evidence-based practices to meet this growing need that we have specifically with students with autism. So the program is really focused on teaching communication and social skills, how to address those uh, interventions for challenging behaviors that Dr. DeBentoncourt mentioned, but in a more um, specific directed way um, that is related specifically to students with autism. There's an opportunity to take a course on learning about serving students with autism in an inclusive classroom. Um, as we, we are seeing increasingly, um, our schools are serving students in that type of classroom. Also, classroom programming that's effective with students with autism, as well as really understanding the current research in the field regarding autism. So now I, I'm actually going to switch us over to talking about two of our certificate programs that we offer here at Hopkins. The first one is the um, Graduate Certificate in Autism, which is an online program. And then we'll also be talking about the Postmaster's Certificate in Applied Behavior Analysis. Um, so actually, let's talk about the ABA program first. So this is considered a Postmaster's Certificate, meaning that you would need your master's degree before entering into this program. And this program is very specific to those individuals who want to become board certified behavior analysts. So folks who are looking to become certified in ABA. And um, the program is really designed for the implementation of ABA in a school-based K through 12 setting. So it's designed for special educators, general educators, coordinators. Um, we've had school psychologists come through our program as well as school counselors. Uh, in this program, students would learn the evidence-based practice of ABA to meet the growing needs of students who receive special ed services. It also supports career goals of special educators as well as other school personnel, like I spoke about with school psychologists who desire the specialized training. Um, it's important to note we are the only school, um, graduate school of education in Maryland to offer this certificate. And then also very important to note that our program um, is verified by the Association for Behavior Analysis International. And this is the professional organization that reviews all of our courses to ensure that they match the Behavior Analyst Certification Board's requirements for courses. So currently, there are some changes going on within our field in that um, our coursework is currently verified for the fourth edition for the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. So they create a task list that identifies all the core skills that behavior analysts must, um, must demonstrate. The BACB just revised their task list and they've moved on to the fifth edition task list. And so we are um, in process for um, offering our courses in fall 2020 to match with the fifth edition task list. That fifth edition goes into play on January 1st, 2022. So students who are entering our program in fall 2020 would need to be prepared to sit for the BCBA exam following the fifth edition task list. So some details on our program, we are a cohort model, which means that all of our students um, go through the entire program together as a cohort. This is a great opportunity for students to network um, to work with other folks in the field. 
And um, the one thing that's really awesome about having this cohort model is once you're done with all the courses and students need to prepare for the behavior analyst certification board exam, they have natural study groups already um, established. So as I was mentioning, we're moving into the fifth edition task list. So these are, um, this is the expected co uh, coursework for beginning this fall 2020. Uh, we will be offering seven courses that align with the fifth edition task list. We also are providing um, practicum coursework to meet the uh, field experience hours, which is 1500 hours in the field. So those will be offered as electives in our program and that's an additional 12 credits. So this uh, postmaster certificate in ABA can be completed part time. Again, it's a face-to-face -face program at our Columbia campus that Dr. DeBettencourt uh, described earlier. And the program can be completed in two years. That's with the seven courses um, that we described. And then um, if students enroll in the practicum electives, that would require another additional year to complete all of the practicum requirements. All the faculty that work in our ABA program are board certified behavior analysts. Um, and um, the real benefits of that is the majority of our faculty are also working in the field of education um, as behavior analysts. Okay, and now I'm going to switch gears and talk about our grad certificate in autism. Um, this program is designed for special educators, certified special educators, professionals from related service services disciplines. I've had principals in this program. I've had paraeducators in this program, community advocates. We've also had parents in this program. And this is um, six courses that are all offered online that are specifically focused on programming for students with autism. And the curriculum addresses communication and social skills. How do we intervene uh, with challenging behaviors? How do we teach in an inclusive classroom? and um, also focuses on the current research in the field of autism. This um, program is, again, all offered online and can be completed in one year. So it can be completed all over the fall, spring, and summer sessions. Okay, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Liz Woodward to talk about the application process. Thank you, Dr. Martyr. So here you'll see kind of our, our, what we call our master grid for our application start terms and deadlines. Um, the mild to moderate master's degree is offers three start terms, so summer, fall, and spring. And as uh, Dr. DeBencourt highlighted, we have an upcoming deadline for our special education immersion program, the Set It program on April 1st. There is still time to apply. Um, and then for anyone coming in and the option for as a, a kind of um, non set it student, we have rolling admission up until the start of the term. You will notice that the um, master's degree in special education with autism focus, severe disabilities, the graduate certificate for autism and the post master certificate for applied behavior analysis are fall only entry terms with a priority consideration date of April 1st. Now by priority submission and completion date means that your application will be reviewed first in order. But we do accept students beyond that on a rolling basis based on space availability up until about a month before the start of the term. Um, so we ask that students really look to that April 1st deadline to commit to completing their application, to submitting their transcripts, and we'll go over some of those details in the next slide. Um, because it is really a benefit for you for organizing financial aid, um, if you're applying for grants or scholarships, it really allows you that time between April 1 and the start of the semester uh, to get your decision, to get your bearings and kind of get settled for so. So we really do push and strongly encourage that priority consideration deadline. As Dr. Uh, DeBettencourt and Dr. Martyr both offered, um, our courses are, for special education are exclusively offered at the Columbia Center location. Courses are typically offered in an evening format, two formats, 415 to 645 or 7 to 930, um, one night a week during the fall and spring semesters. We have summer courses also with the two nights a week. 
In our internships, we have a dedicated field experience office, and of course, Dr. Martyr and Dr. DeBettencourt work very closely with you um, on your mentoring and internship experiences. Um, so that's a little bit about how you would particularly take a look at that schedule to see if that fits with your current schedule. Um, some of the milestones to graduation, um, and we're going a little bit out of order, so I'm going to ask Dr. DeBedencourt to jump in here. Um, in addition to doing that, we also like to give you an idea of, um, you know, not only the time frame, the course offerings, and what's going to be required, but some of the things, external things um, that you need to do to finish your degree, um, and particularly if you're going to be earning a mild to moderate with initial certification, what outside steps and things you need to be aware of along the way. So Dr. Bencourt, would you mind uh, talking to this? Sure, slide? sure. Hi again. Um, one of the things that the State Department requires of all teachers is that they complete the Praxis II in special education and the Praxis II in reading. Our students have had no difficulty passing these exams based on the coursework that they take with us. So there's really no stress there. Our students score very high on these exams. And again, it's a pass-fail. There is a, a cutoff score, but our students have never even been close to that cutoff score. So many, uh, again, that's part of the certification requirements from the state. We also ask that all of our students sit for a comprehensive exam, and that's usually a three-hour exam where you come into the lab and you write about general special education issues, specific issues related to kids with disabilities on the mild moderate idea of, of disabilities in the sense that you might be asked specific questions about what happens when a, a child is identified as uh, having some learning disabilities. This semester we're doing it um, a bit creatively online and um, then you have a graduate project and the graduate project is actually I think somewhat fun in that you get to demonstrate how you would implement an intervention with a student, monitor their progress, and talk about the success you had with the student. Most of our students complete that during their um, last internship. So these, pro these milestones, we call them, are just ways for you to demonstrate the competencies that you gain by going through our program. Thank you, Dr. DeBencourt. It's important to notice that these are um, requirements that you are completing in the program. They are not admissions requirements. We'll get to those next. So at a minimum, uh, for all applicants are required to submit the following requirements. It is important to note that as we talk about prerequisite requirements, we are looking for a, a competitive applicant will have a 3.0 or higher cumulative undergraduate uh, GPA. You must complete the online application form, which includes uploading a current um, updated copy of your CV, a goal statement or personal statement about your interest in um, entering or getting an advanced degree in the field of education, um, an $80 application fee, and official transcripts from all post-secondary institutions attended. And that includes any institution where you may have taken courses but not earned a degree. We do require all officials. Um, as I mentioned, the SAN resume statement to be uploaded, and then two letters of recommendation from professionals, academics, um, that can attest to your ability to um, research, write, and to kind of to perform academically as a graduate student. Our application review process um, is all decisions and reviews are made by a faculty committee, um, and usually by our faculty leads. And they can speak a little bit to what they're looking for in candidates, but our, our process across the School of Education is holistic. Um, and so in other words, we, do a, we really do look at every aspect of your application, uh, your goals, your career directory, your trajectory. Um, there are, however, for certain programs, such as the Postmasters and Applied Behavior Analysis, there are some certain very hard prerequisites um, you know, which include a master's degree in a very specific area. Um, but we'll let in the question and answer period, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have about um, your particular backgrounds and, and interest in how you would, you know, your eligibility for certain areas. 
For international applicants, uh, there are additional requirements which include English language testing. Um, and for anyone who has earned a degree outside the United States or Canada, um, we do require what we call an international credential evaluation where your university will send to uh, a third party uh, credential evaluation agency your transcripts. They will translate and um, transfer those into the US credit based system and that will serve as your official transcript for us. Um, we do have additional resources on our website in the admissions section if you'd like to take a look at those and they apply to you. Lastly, I'd like to talk about tuition fees, grants and scholarships. Um, we have just announced our academic year 2020-21 tuition and fees, which we're scheduled to start in this summer. Um, so you'll see the face-to-face -face rate for course and then the cost per course. So you'll see cost per credit, cost per course. Um, we also have a registration fee that is applied each semester that you're registered um, and then Below that, we've put the total projected cost for the programs that we're offering. So um, severe autism focus would, would follow um, this, the same vein here, but I put the three primary kind of what a master's degree would look like, what a post-master's would look like, and then the online autism cert. Please do keep in mind that some of these programs do offer online courses, they give you the opportunity to do that, those are assessed at a different and higher rate. So the, this is uh, meant to be an estimate, not a quote, and we'll certainly be happy to answer any questions that you may have about that. Financial aid and scholarships, 82% um, of our degree seeking enrolled students borrow graduate loans through the federal financial aid system. And one important note, if you are new to kind of graduate admissions, um, for graduate students, uh, there are, it is all loan-based through the federal government. So a significant portion uh, do do that. And each year requires you to complete the free application for federal student aid and a planned enrollment form. Um, and our financial aid office is uh, very dutiful about notifying students when forms open and deadlines and things that you need to do along the way. We do encourage anyone who's serious about applying for an upcoming term let's say you're interested in um, starting in summer or fall, that you can complete the FAFSA form at the same time you're completing your application. It doesn't um, obligate you to borrow anything, but it puts you in line should you decide to make your admissions decision and saves quite a bit of time. I frequently get questions from applicants well, I'm going to wait and see if I was admitted to the program, then I'll apply for financial aid. I would actually encourage students to do the opposite. For every program you're looking at, you can list up to 10 schools, but to fill out that FAFSA form because it helps you give a sense of how you're going to financially plan um, your graduate tuition. We also offer a limited number of partial need-based scholarships that are available for fall and spring semesters each academic year. For our master's and graduate students, April 1st is the submission deadline. And I also am encouraging students more and more to look at some of the uh, scholarships available for teachers out on sites like scholarship.com and teacher.org. Every little bit helps you along your, your graduate journey. Um, when I was a graduate student, I applied for some of these external scholarships and I was successful. They certainly helped me with books and other expenses along the way. Um, so uh, I encourage students to look both externally and to apply for our institutional scholarship. And now we're going to our question and answer period. So I'm going to invite our participants to type in their questions to chat. I will read those aloud and hopefully we can answer some questions for you today. Give everyone a minute. Um, hi, I'd like to, this is Dr. DeBettencourt again. I'd like to just add a couple things. One is with our scholarships, we often have the money in our department in the field of special education Avail more money available than applicants. So please consider that even if you're considering applying to the SEDIT partnership with Montgomery County because you may still want some money for books and other things. So do think about um, applying for the on the April by the April 1 deadline so that you can receive some scholarship money for the fall and the spring semesters. The other thing I was going to mention was Dr. Martyr and I review applications the minute they come into our 
file box. So as soon as your application is complete, admissions office will move it over into our box and we review it quite quickly. I did one this morning before logging on to this um, webinar. So feel, please put your application in and know that you will receive an answer fairly quickly. And if you have any questions along the way, either Dr. Martyr or myself or our helpful assistant, Camilla Mika Sims can provide some answers to you so that you can complete it rather quickly. Okay. You see, I'm gonna check our chat box. I'm hoping we have some folks that are willing to do that. Uh, if you have some questions for us. Okay, I have a quick question um, for mild to moderate disabilities for Dr. DeBencourt. Can you explain um, a typical, um, Here's the question that's coming in. I apologize, hold on a moment. Um, Haley has joined us and she says, I'm currently a special education teacher for Frederick County Public Schools. Okay, bear with me. Um, I currently work at a school for students with moderate to profound disabilities. Would I be able to do my internship at my school for an autism profound program? Hi Haley, yes, we try to work out the internships so that you can do at least one in your place of employment. We recognize that many teachers can't afford to leave their job. The reason they're coming to our program is to learn how to do their job better. So we work closely with the field experience office, which works with the school district itself in getting all of the requirements set up so the internships can be done in their place of employment. So the answer is yes. And please keep in mind that in the program, coming from Frederick, you can come pretty quickly um, to the Columbia campus across Route 200 um, or some other fast paced highways. We do have students from that area and two of our courses are online. So that if you are thinking, how am I going to make the courses in Columbia for 13 um, courses, you really only have to do 11 and um, that are faced to 11 courses plus the two internships make 13, but of those 11, two are online. So it's really only nine courses. Hope that helps. Thank you, Haley. Excellent question. Dr. DeBencourt, during the internship phase, can you describe a typical schedule? Are you also taking classes or are you during, are you taking classes in the evening and doing your internships during the day? Can you describe a little bit about what that looks like for students? Sure. Most students take, because they're working, most students try to take two courses a semester, one or two, depending on uh, what else they're juggling in terms of child care, husbands, dogs, things like that. So if you were taking your internship, that would be one, and then you might take another course as well. And that other course may be the online one, so you don't have to drive into Columbia for the second course. The other thing that we've instituted um, this past year is our seminars with the internship instructor are done by Zoom so that once you finish your day at your internship or your place of employment, you would then meet every other week with your internship instructor by Zoom, which is like Skype, and you wouldn't have to drive in to meet with the instructor if you were taking a second course that was face-to-face. -face. So let's say you took the internship and a face-to-face -face course. You would drive to Columbia one night a week for your face-to-face -face course, and then during your internship, you would be doing a Zoom meeting or a Skype meeting with your internship instructor. If you were doing the internship during the time you're taking an online course, you wouldn't have to drive into Columbia at all. I hope that helps. Dr. Martyr, would you be able to explain a little bit more about the um, more detail, the new practica or the new practicum requirements uh, as the 12 credits of electives? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, our practicum courses, uh, the way they are designed, um, we provide our students with uh, BCBAs who will supervise all of their work. So the way that we do the practicum each semester of the four semesters, you can um, accrue 375 hours per semester 
And that includes one and a half hours of supervision with a board certified behavior analyst and one hour of what we call group supervision with a uh, faculty member at Hopkins who is also a board certified behavior analyst. So we combine those two types of supervision within our practicum coursework. Um, and that group supervision is our practicum course that is face-to-face -face at the Columbia campus. So students are accrued 25 hours per week over a 15 week semester, which equals out to 375 hours. And if you do the math across four practicum courses, that will equal the 1500 hours that are required by the BACB. We have a really specific curriculum that we follow for our practicum courses so that each student's field experience um, at um, our ABA program is meaningful and robust. So all of our students um, will, um, their practicum experience will be individualized for them and um, based on their current knowledge already within the field. Again, we also try to place all of our students, just like Dr. Betancourt was saying for the special ed programs, um, we want to make sure that all of our students can complete their practicum experience in their place of employment if they, you know, we need to make sure that they are obviously practicing behavior analysis in their sites or have the opportunity to practice behavior analysis in their sites. If they do not, um, or they're not currently employed in a school setting or a place where behavior analysis is practiced, we work with them. We have a practice, an excellent practicum coordinator who helps place all of our students um, and make sure that all of their experiences follow the behavior analyst certification board's requirements. So we can also place you, um, we have partners throughout the community um, that where we can place you in an approved, um, pro, uh, approved placement site. Okay. Um, we have a question from uh, our audience, Lee, thank you. It says, hi, thank you for the great presentation. I was just wondering, is the summer course mandatory? Um, so Lee I'll start first. This is Dr. DeBet yeah. for the mild moderate program. Once you enter the mild moderate program, you and I become great friends and we meet regularly either online or face to face to go over your program of study. Some courses are only offered in the fall and the spring. Some are offered fall, spring, and summer. So we plan out your life. I kind of make it easy for you not to have to think about when the courses are offered. If you can't take a course over the summer, then we plan it so that you don't take any courses over the summer. Most of our uh, candidates enjoy taking the summer courses because typically at that point, they have a little bit more free time. But again, everyone is an individual and we work individually with each student to make sure that we can meet your needs in terms of what other balls you're juggling and childcare, family, travel, whatever it is. And so that we plan out when the courses are best met, best match your particular life, whatever's going on. There are a couple courses that we offer in the summer that are online as well. So some of our students who have other things that they have to do over the summer take the online courses at that point because they don't have to drive anywhere to sit face to face. Our summer courses also, I might point out, are a bit shorter than our fall and spring courses because the summer schedule runs a bit shorter and, that's, and the meetings that are face to face are two times a week. So they're typically only about seven weeks long rather than 15 weeks long. And again, once you enter the program, you'll sit with me and we'll go over your program of studies and we'll plan it out. And some things change. So we might have to meet again because some of our students have babies or some of our students have to travel to take care of their parents. So we, we meet regularly to make sure it works for you. Hope that helps. Wonderful, thank you. Um, question, Dr. DeBedencourt, does the mild to moderate program have uh, any online course opportunities as the severe disabilities autism focus degree does? Um, and if so, how many courses are available offered online? So the mild moderate program has two courses online. And we have one new message. Thank you to our audience. 
This is, uh, this is from Haley. Um, could I possibly complete the autism and severe master's program and then do the post-master's BCBA program? I've debated doing my master's in special education or BCBA, and that seems like the best of both worlds. Dr. Martyr, would you like to take that? Sure, um, that is definitely a possibility. Um, and I would, um, thanks Haley for asking that question. I would encourage you to reach out to me. I think uh, Liz said that there's gonna be um, contact information at the end of this presentation. Um, so I um, recommend that you reach out to me so that we can um, talk about those options and what that would look like. But yes, that is definitely a possibility. Great, wonderful, thank you, Haley. That's a great question and a good reminder to us that um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Martyr, in terms of qualifying for the post-master's ABA, the degrees that you, master's degree that you need to earn can be in special education, psychology, or applied behavior analysis, is that correct? Um, yeah, or education. Or education. Um, I know that um, we, we actually follow BACB requirements for master's degrees, and it's my understanding that with the new requirements with the fifth edition that it's open to most master's degrees now. Um, so they've actually opened that um, requirement. It used to be only psychology, uh, uh, psychology education or behavior analysis, but it seems that that has opened. So we typically... Um, not typically, we do follow the BACB uh, requirements on master's degrees, so that may be opening as well, but in the past it's been that way. So essentially both of our master's programs, mild to moderate and the autism focus, severe disabilities are great pathways to then going into that post-master's applied Absolutely. program. Yeah, um, that is correct, yep. We encourage students to think about that option. It's a very um, great combination for launching your career in the field. I just wanted to turn everyone's attention as we close or get close to. Um, okay, uh, we might have one additional question. Haley, thank you. Um, your concern about get you're concerned about getting your official transcripts. Hold on a second, reading your note as it comes in from your undergrad because the university is closed, but I do have them saved. Is would that be enough to attach to my application? Um, depending on your undergraduate, where you graduated from, Hallie, most schools have a connection with the National Student Clearinghouse. Um, and I'd be happy to pick up with you offline about this um, to work with you on the requirements. But the National Student Clearinghouse is still operational. So if you're able to order your official transcripts from that, um, from the clearinghouse, that would be our first preference. If you uh, are looking for kind of an evaluation, um, you can certainly send us your undergraduate. It's not going to fulfill the official requirement, um, but you could send them in as a placeholder for now, and we'd be happy to take a look at them. But please let us know if your previous institution does offer that, because we have a connection where they'll send it to us electronically. We accept transcripts from the National Student Clearinghouse and other services like Parchment and eScripts, um, and most schools, I would say almost 85%, if you are a graduate before or after 2008, um, will have your transcripts available through the Clearinghouse. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, Mount St. Mary's. Yes, we do get electronic transcripts from Mount St. Mary's. Um, what I would ask you to do is to go out and request it to their website and just search request official transcript and they should be able to um, give you some instructions for ordering. If not, please connect with me. Great questions. Anyone else before we wrap up today? So um, Liz, this is Dr. DeBetancourt. I just wonder if we, um, I'll give you my email and Dr. Martyr can log on and give, oh, there you go. There you go. This is uh, Dr. DeBetancourt and I will email everyone who's participated today, uh, Dr. Martyr's email contact, as well as Camilla Mika Sims. Camilla can help coordinate um, a phone conversation or any questions that you have with Dr. DeBettencourt or Dr. Martyr. Thanks everyone for attending this Dr. DeBettencourt. Thank you everyone and we look forward to connecting with you soon and look forward to receiving your application. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us.